Larry um, really, I suppose, began from the, the clinical side, began his medical <coughs> training uh, in South Carolina, did internships, followed the routes of uh, research fellowships and clinical fellowships in hematology, the sort of sister discipline to us in immunology, um, joined faculty at MUSC, uh, on to Minnesota, and really from about 2008, started to look at this work on uh, NCATS, which I think is still a very underappreciated and even understudied, definitely understudied uh, aspect of uh, mast cell disease. Uh, he's now more recently moved into uh, uh, New York, where I know he's working on establishing a center uh, for this whole family of diseases. So, um, without further ado, I thought it might, uh, as Professor Mann said, um, that this is a, um, a grossly underappreciated area, a recently recognized disease. Not a new disease, there are no such things, but it's a newly recognized disease. And I thought it might help you begin to connect to what is in truth a very complex entity. If you could first hear, I'm going to give my own case presentation, but I thought it might be best if we could start with the case presentation from one of your fellow countrymen who have, who has actually uh, suffered uh, through the, the, the course, a lifetime, nearly a lifetime course uh, with the disease. So, uh, the organizer of the event, uh, Gavin Tobin, uh, uh, we're going to let him tell his story, and then we'll move on into my presentation. I think I'm the first person in Ireland to be diagnosed with this, so patient zero, I know it's for infectious diseases, but like I said, I'm the first person I think pardon. Uh, so, here we're with. Um, so, in my late teens, I worked here. Um, I won't get into where it is, but I, I worked in this facility. And you're all here tonight because I was here. And when I went in here in my late teens, shortly afterward, my health started to decline, physical and mental. Um, we have uh, hexamelic going in here with solvents. You can see it dripping out of the uh, extractor plant. And um, that area was subsequently found to be exceptionally dangerous. Um, but for me, that's a uh, very uh, dividing line of where my health went. My whole time in primary school, I'd never been to a doctor, and then suddenly things started to go. So I won't go on, but it's, um, so it, which has led me to believe that this disease essentially is an intolerance to modernity. It's an intolerance to um, chemicals, man made chemicals, what we eat, drink, and breathe. And it's all, you know, it's all around us. And that's where I'm going to tip for that, but there's quite a specific. Um, who am I? Gavin Tobin, age 48, married two children. I'm a former military aircraft mechanic. Kind of, uh, I would highlight military because military meant we didn't have a union, because we didn't have a union, we didn't have health and safety. Um, I'm a small business uh, person. Um, um, I own two businesses. Um, one has been bouncing around the bottom um, because I suffer chronic fatigue a lot. And it's very hard to run a business when you were shattered. Um, and actually, I was at a rare disease conference for me, it might have been at some of these last year, and one of the head medical people there said to me, Would you look healthy? You know what? Looking healthy and being healthy are two things. Uh, formerly very active involved in community involved, I was a director of a credit union, I was a scout leader, uh, I'd set up little walking clubs, I was a rower, um, I was in the national championships, I was in top of photography, and national medals for photography, and all that is kind of gone. I've regressed, and now it's, you can't end up much called what I call survival mode. Uh, but I'm still doing a lot better than 99% of the people with this disease, I have it less. Um, formerly very ambitious and confident, and you know, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm going to get back there. Okay. So, these are some of my symptoms. It kicked off really with anxiety, chronic fatigue. And the anxiety for me, uh, I've learned to recognize um, anxiety for me was an artificial sensation of fear that was triggered by my MS. Um, if you don't recognize that it's an artificial sensation, you treat it as an emotion, and you blame work, you blame family, you blame study, you blame a lot of things. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome started having soft stools. So, uh, by the way, I thought this was for doctors for Wednesday. I don't think it was given to all these. It's more uh, risky than I had planned, okay? Uh, growing relish, vulnerable infection. Okay. It, it turned out not to be. You know, for 20 years, I've been given that tarot, and it turned out to be that an antihistamine got rid of it. So, it's probably uh, a reaction to my own side. Uh, concentration learning difficulties. Uh, very recently, I've gone on Ritalin, and it has turned back on my brain only in the past three weeks. And my CPU was just in a sleep state. But now I'm starting to work again. Um, insomnia, 
Um, it, it just, just destroys you. I won't go through them all, obesity, back to the shoulder pain. Some of these are very significant. This one here, uh, 2003, I started vomiting seven or eight times a day for 10 months. Um, um, I, I thought I was dying. Um, I went from, well, I am now, that day to two kilos. Everyone said to me, looking well. I thought I was dying. Um, and I was again, because of anxiety, but I was blaming things around me. Um, my wife was trying to get me to get married, and I was like, this is why I was so stressed. Um, <laughs> and, but it was hard, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, um, but as it turned out, I made that moving into a new business premises. The business premises was made of polyurethane, and I had a problem with isocyanates and polyurethane. And I had a new car with polyurethane, new carpets, new mattresses, new pillows. I was essentially like Superman, living in a kryptonite house, and I didn't know what it was making me safe. But isocyanates were an immune sensitizer, People sensitized to them can react to one part per billion, and you can make antibodies to them, to their human uh, HSA uh, and isocyanate conjugates. So they are, the industry says they're inert. I don't think so. Uh, hypervigilance, again, that's like anxiety, but just where you worry about things too much. As, a, as an aircraft mechanic, you're taught to always look for snags. I looked for snags when I wasn't. Um, I found out it was infertile, I did end up having two children through IVF. Um, but these are all clues away. Random pain. Um, I started suffering these pains, like if somebody was cutting the finger off, stabbed me in the eye, just these random pains, that were nearly making me crash. Again, around the time when I got a new Ford Transit, and the plastic, I think, of the van was doing it. Uh, that caused me to end up with a pain, uh, a drug called uh, uh, Cymbalta, for pain, which is an antidepressant. Uh, but three days later, I realized I had no anxiety. And I didn't know I was suffering anxiety until it was gone. But I'd learned extremely well to put that in mind of it. The problem is, I got me on the merry round of antidepressants, which I found hard. Um, I started with shakes, painful urination. Well, I thought to the doctors with this one. Um, um, but stuff I've gotten rid of, it. and it's stuff that's actually causing havoc for urologists. Um, headaches, mild, but decades long, so that chest pain. So, chest pain, you can go to your doctor with chest pain, and suddenly now you're rushed off for ECGs, and everything's okay. But I was getting that from running because of diesel exhaust on the roads. Um, more chest pain, I, I got a new car, the car plastic, the roof, the full of polyurethanes, chest pain, and anxiety. Uh, I went to a rescue just to say, when I drove double board tunnel, I like, get chest tightness and I suffer anxiety. And he said, well, let's park the anxiety. He says, why? Because I'm not a psychiatrist. And I'm, but it's easily exhausted. It's related. And that's the problem with the compartmentalization of medicine. Very much <laughs> intolerance is sometimes like an A, A, B, and C. Sometimes I could be there. So that would drive me mad. But as I learned more about the things that had histamine, or learned that if I had A, B, and C and did exercise, I couldn't tolerate the foods. And again, it like so. Um, Back pain, I, I suffered a lot of pain, and I got rid of the pain by H1 and H2 and DSD. So, most people don't think that DSD is a pain, but they do for me. And I had some dangerous reactions to some of the um, antidepressants that would have led me making a complaint to the HPR. Not a complaint, but an adverse reaction to the board, which is very important. I don't think people do it. Um, okay, I saw loads of this gastroenterologists and doctrinologists, rheumatologists, gynecologists, because that's because that's a couple of them children, so that's why that's there. Toxicologist, uh, neurologist, Psychologist, psychiatrist, I was in, I'm involved in some legal cases. If you Google me, you'll see me. Um, um, uh, urologist, uh, immunologist, that's, that's a private joke. Um, um, rest, there's four immunologists for the whole of Ireland. Uh, respiratory medicine consultant, and then finally Dr. Affin. And how I discovered Dr. Affin, myself and my wife were away uh, for the weekend in, in Antwerp, and just looked at this video and just found it. And, um, Two weeks later, in front of my family and my wife, I broke down uh, because 25 years of looking for my health and uh, my wife thought I'd lost it. The kids had never seen me cry. I couldn't surprise. I felt good. It was a release. And uh, it was very funny because everyone was crying because I was crying. I had not cried since um, So um, I had gotten a, uh, an electrician had put a charger into my business for my electric car. He was expanding foam. I came into work the next day. I had acknowledged I had chronic fatigue for six weeks. And it turned out that there was in that chronic, in that phone, was a thing called methyl diphenyl isocyanide. Again, an isocyanide, made to use polyurethane, but it had been making me sick in 2003. And that led me to realize that I could be overproducing histamine, and overproducing histamine, when I took antihistamines, I could relieve a pain like that. I, came up, I was coming home from work at 1 o'clock in the day, I'm self employed, you're not going to make a living at that. And I was coming home in pain. My wife made dinner one night, I had the dinner, I was eating more pain. And um, what it turned out was the dinner was uh, sauerkraut, salmon. And, and on the salmon, there was some, um, some uh, Cajun seasoning. Cajun seasoning it has yeast extract, and yeast extract is MSG. There's no other way around it. It's how they beat the label. It's a big problem with our food chain. So, um, so I realized that I had NCAS. I started trying to get appointments with immunologists in Ireland and trying to and Some refused to treat me. Some said they didn't believe in it. Um, some said medicine doesn't accept this. Um, but um, 
I have found Dr. Ashton and I decided, right, let's go. So, um, found in 2018, and I think in November when I got the appointment. Um, I don't know if any of you see how ironic it is, but I went over to America looking for a diagnosis of MCAS on a Boeing 737 MAX 8. Does anyone get that one? <laughs> That's why they were going down because of maneuverable, char maneuverable characteristic applications and they were crashing because of MCAS. So it would have been ironic. Um, when Dr. Ashton, he interviewed me for four hours. There's nobody here seen a doctor for four hours unless they're married to him. Right? That just doesn't happen. Um, we I had loads in your eye and drive down to New Jersey. And they were sent to specialist labs, some of them reference labs, research labs. Um, and they were sent to California, Missouri, Montana, and Utah. They had to be chilled. Bloods were meant to be taken into chilled vials, into chilled centrifuges. Because some of the mass cell media, because we were looking for at a half life only 30 seconds. Um, at the same time, sorry, we went and found three media. We were looking for two and we found three. But at the same time, back here, I was very fearful that I was going to go to the States and we weren't going to find anything. And Dr. Reference says, well, you know, uh, if, if we don't find media, we'll do an upper and lower scope and we can. Do a CD moment seven staining and see what we can find. And um, I said, Well, look, I've already had upper and lower scopes. And he said, Well, get them archived. And it turns out if you've ever been scoped, they're there in an archive. And we got them back, we got them stained. And after a lot of chasing, and after I've been diagnosed, I got these CD moment seven stains that, that strengthened the diagnosis. Um, I then find my triggers. So this is what I do. I have, you know, step one, the doctor after before even diagnosis, right? Step one, identify the my triggers. Find out what's causing you a problem. Okay? So as humans, as fish fragrances. Next step is, is H1 and H2 antihistamine regime, um, because the, any cells that react to histamine have, mass, have H1 and H2, there's no point in blocking one if you don't want the other. Uh, I'm also in a mass cell stabilizer called sodium chromic glycate, which allows me to uh, withstand other people's fragrances. Fragrances were, were causing me serious pain, headache, nausea, and anxiety. And uh, low dose methamphetamine, uh, Pritlin, we call it now, that has uh, turned my brain back on. Um, I can, if I have give an email address at the end of this, if anyone wants to photograph the email address and ask for the slides, there's no problem. I'll edit some of the boring bits. Um, these are just some personal triggers. They're unique to me, but I think some of them might be common. Some quite preserved and stable, and uh, hidden, hidden ones are important. Uh, what I learned is that Ireland has moved away from sugar and towards sugar replacements, namely coming from America, lupus syrup, fructose syrup, multidextrin, dextrose, corn flour, maize starch. And those all come from corn, and to process the corn, they have to soak it in sulfuric acid. And when they soak it in sulfuric acid, they introduce sulfites. And people don't know the region of sulfites. Now, the European Food Safety Authority are reassessing the safety of sulfites because they think we're over consuming it. But people don't know. How can you be, if it's less than 10 milligrams per kilo or less than 10 milligrams per kilo, you don't have to put it on the label. How do people know they're allergic to something when it's not on the label? If you hit peanuts, what would happen? Right? MSG, I think that's another problem. It's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It was originally sulfur dumping acid. Then they found a way of making it. Of yeast, ext uh, yeast extract and not MSG, but it's just more it's the same thing. And now it's gone natural failure. Citric acid is another one of these things that we don't know. From. People think it comes from lemons and oranges, it comes from feeding uh, glucose syrup to black mold. And again, so uh, High seeds to mean salmon, they're natural foods, but this is if you have an issue with this illness, these are things that you just have to uh, you know, avoid naturally. Isocyanates, I've said that already. VOCs, petrol, all these type of things, we know they're dangerous. Just respect that. And sometimes you look at things in small tins where different people park in because they expect you want the big thing like what I've shown there. And airplane models with my kids out in the back garden in the wind, the Telefix model. I was in well, and that was frequent stays. Hydrocarbon fuels, uh, fragrance is perfect for the ovens. I think we need fragrance free legislation for people who suffer from this. Like way of smoking legislation. Um, it's important. For me, unfortunately, exercise and sport is a trigger. If I do um, a long slow distance cycle, um, I will pay a price. I'm too 40 minute games of squash a month was taking 10 minutes of productivity out of me. It was just that much of an impact on fatigue and anxiety and gastric upset from playing sport. Um, so these are some takeaways. Um, legally hiding allergens in our food chain appears to be a bad idea. If we hit nuts, it would be a bad idea. Uh, MSG, I think they need to be put on the allergen list. Um, and natural flavoring, that just needs to be banned. It's just a little bit of the high stuff. Uh, Isocyanate-based insulation. We're forcing our homes now to be more insulated. We're trapping that inside us. We have a mechanical ventilation recovery system that changes the air. It wouldn't be too bad, but I think there's a danger, especially for children. Um, isocyanate carpet. Again, lighter spandex elastin, they're all made from isocyanate. Wash before you wear. Uh, petrol and diesel needs to be banned as a matter of urgency from our towns and cities. Diesel exhaust in our towns and cities is causing serious harm. And MCAS is going to allow us to measure that harm. That chest pain and anxiety I felt from driving the Dublin Park Tunnel. We can measure my blood, drive me through a Dublin tunnel, measure it again, we can see it actually happening. Uh, pregnancy, I think refueling is a pregnancy risk. 
uh, the fuel in your car. And then the chemist just said, like I said, go back to the anxiety. Uh, I think a very important thing that I learned was to separate the sensation of anxiety from the emotion of anxiety. And once you do that, life gets much easier because you stop blaming other people around you or yourself or anything like that. Um, I think if psychiatrists take up just that particular takeaway, I think it can change how psychiatry will work. Uh, wrap up. Okay, so Dr. Arthur's lecture, I, 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 I realized the enormity of this when I found it. The penny dropped for me at how big this disease is. Um, I had a I won't go on go further, but this this um, I hope you get it. Um, okay, I thought this was the doctors. And this is just one key takeaway. Anything that we currently believe is safe in our foods, in our indoor air quality, in our outdoor air quality, in medicines, anything we consider that we do consider safe has never been measured for safety through the prism of this disease. Right? So and this is a new disease that it's it's big on new So that's it. If you'd like to photograph that, I'm happy to take uh, you know, drop me a mail and give you the slides. Let's uh, dive into what is, I uh, can't apologize for it, it is what it is, the consequence of the biology of this, it is a complex subject. Um, we are just beginning to understand this, so our learning objectives to understand basic emerging concepts regarding mass cell biology and disease, uh, particularly the relationships among the various mast cell diseases, uh, but we'll spend the majority of the hour on um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and uh, I, I don't think we'll have time to get into the nursing issues, and I can't possibly get into the details of diagnosing and treating this, um, but uh, I'll cover it at a high level for you toward the end. Uh, but there are a lot of important concepts to get to before we get into specifics of diagnosis and treatment. I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare. We'll talk first about what we've long known about mast cell disease, uh, which is actually not all that much. And then we'll talk uh, for the majority of the hour uh, about the new kid on the mast cell disease block, uh, MCAS. Um, now, you've heard one sample case of this disease. How I came to it, again, I'm a hematologist oncologist, so for the first 13 years of my career post-training, I was just routinely getting referred patients with hematologic or oncologic uh, problems. And it was pure serendipity that I came into this area that's now been my focus for the last uh, bit more than a decade. Uh, back in, uh, and uh, what really struck me as I was beginning to learn about this, my first few cases, was just how extraordinarily diverse the superficial clinical presentations were at, 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 at a, to, to, to uh, all appearances. These patients appeared very differently from one another. And yet, when we dug far enough, we found the same root problem underlying each of these patients. So the very first patient who came to me, uh, and, and I want to illustrate this diversity with uh, at least a couple of cases. We'll go through this quite quickly. The first patient came to me again on a hematologist oncologist, had a patient come to me for a second opinion regarding a case of polycythemia vera, a disease, a cancer of the red blood cells. Uh, gross overproduction of the red blood cells. And then the second patient in whom I came to recognize this had exactly the opposite phenologic problem. Pure red cell aplasia. The bone marrow had just completely given up making red blood cells. And then the third patient in whom I came to recognize this veered off in an entirely different direction. She had a disease that I had never heard of before. Uh, it turns out to be actually fairly prevalent. Uh, the U.S. NIH did a survey back in 1990, found that 1% of all people in the United States have a chronically burning mouth. By and large, nobody's ever been able to figure out why. Uh, so uh, we'll cover these three cases very quickly. The lady with PVERA or PV. 
Back in the 80s, a healthy uh, young woman began to notice a migratory rash over time, a variety of constitutional, uh, some might say dermatologic and neurologic issues uh, began emerging. She was highly productive, uh, high functioning, independent, small business woman, very stoic woman. Uh, she didn't go to doctors very often, but when she did, uh, when these problems got bad enough to send her to the doctor, the evaluations were always negative. Finally, the fatigue got so bad, it was really starting to interfere with her business. And she went to her primary care doctor, who appropriately obtained the blood count on her, expecting to find she was anemic from the explanation for her severe fatigue. And to his surprise, she was the opposite. She had too many red blood cells. Not a huge excess like we typically find in PV, but nevertheless an excess. And this primary care doctor was not too familiar with PV. He's a primary care doctor, not a hematologist, oncologist. So he thought maybe this is just kind of the early stage of PV and referred the patient to a hematologist who unfortunately did not do an appropriate diagnostic evaluation at the time for PV and incorrectly concluded the patient had this cancer when in fact she did not. And he began treating her in the standard fashion in which we treat PV, which is to say, if you have too much blood, then we will take it out of you until you have the right amount. And so she had a series of uh, phlebotomy treatments that drained blood out of her and uh, quickly made her anemic which is the goal in treating PV. But you'd like to think that if you give the right treatment for the right diagnosis, the patient ought to get better. And she just kept getting worse in a myriad of fashions. And she kept asking the hematologist, are you sure you have the right diagnosis? And he was so confident based on his inappropriate workup that uh, he actually doubled down on the treatment. He doubled the amount of phlebotomy he was doing to her and made her more anemic. And well, then she had extra reason for the fatigue. She wasn't getting anywhere with that doctor and she finally self-referred and landed in my lab. We had a large division of hematologists and oncologists at my university and uh, uh, everybody had their specialties, uh, myeloma, prostate cancer, breast cancer, whatever. I was the lone wolf, kind of the dumping. I, I like doing it all. And so I was the dumping ground for the mystery cases. And so she got put in my clinic. And it took me 60 seconds of history to realize she couldn't possibly have... She couldn't possibly have PB. Uh, I, I know this is my ego talking a little bit, but I, I'm a hematologist. I know PB. And she wasn't, I, yes, she had a mildly elevated hemoglobin and red cell count to begin with, but otherwise she didn't look anything. She wasn't behaving anything like PB behaved. So the question became what do you have? that can cause not only an elevation in the hemoglobin, but also all of these many, many other problems across all these systems in the body. By that point uh, in the timeline, this is early 2008, we actually had uh, developed a test that could very precisely prove or disprove whether a patient has PV. So, why the other doctor had not yet done this to confirm his diagnosis, I don't know, but I ran the test, quickly proved for sure she does not have PV. And then the question is, what do you have? And I am aware of all of the other known causes of an elevation in the hemoglobin, but the funny thing was, she didn't look like she had any of those other diseases. And so I, one of the things I began considering right from the beginning was this rare cancer of the mast cells called mastocytosis, uh, which, I mean, it's a rare disease to begin with, but in rare cases of mastocytosis, you actually can generate an increase in the hemoglobin. And she had a lot of other features that I thought kind of matched with mastocytosis. And so I did the standard diagnostic testing for mastocytosis, and she was completely negative, multiple times over. And yet, 
nothing else was making sense. And so I began reading more and more about the biology of the mast cells. I began learning about other ways to possibly detect mastocytosis. I learned about this marker, prostaglandin D2. I don't know about how medical school here in Ireland goes these days, but in my medical school, uh, they sure didn't teach me about prostaglandin D2. Uh, but I learned it's a very specific, it's a, it's a good marker for mast cell activation when it's uh, elevated. And it turns out to be very difficult to measure accurately. I made every mistake one can make in measuring it. And each time I got back a negative result, I realized I made this mistake or that mistake. And I corrected them, I, checked, I tried it again. And finally, after I got all the mistakes fixed, I found she indeed had an elevated urinary prostate D2. But I'm an oncologist and we are taught it's in the core of our training that you cannot diagnose a cancer unless you have the tissue that has the cancer in it on a microscope slide with a pathologist signing off a report that says this is cancer. And so she did not have the uh, clusters of mast cells, uh, the sheets of mast cells that one should have the mastocytosis. She didn't have it in the, skin, in the biopsies we did of the rashes. She certainly didn't have it in the, the two bone marrow biopsies that I did on her. And so where else to go looking? Um, obviously, this was an atypical case of mastocytosis. So where else do you go looking? Again, back to the books. Where are the mast cells in the human body? In truth, they're everywhere. Sparsely distributed. You can take random biopsies all you want. You'll probably never find these cells. They are sparsely distributed, but they're dominantly sighted. Now, you, know, you more commonly find them at the environmental interfaces, so the skin, which I'd already biopsied, that was negative, respiratory tract, GI tract, and, and genital urinary tract. So the GI tract was the least worst place to go biopsy. Next, so that's what I did. And it's an interesting story. I don't have time to go through it, but the bottom line was on routine staining, what we call hematoxylin and eosin staining, H and E staining of the uh, duodenum, this was 100% textbook normal. Our senior GI pathologist said he could print this in a textbook as the definition of normal. And then I told him, you must now go do the special staining that is required to be able to see the mast cells in the specimen. Because it turns out, with routine H&E staining, the mast cells actually masquerade as other types of cells which you normally expect to find in a biopsy, like lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, histiocytes, spindle cells. So he went off and did the, the, the CD-117 staining, and he called me and he was literally stuttering. For the first time in 20 years I had known him, he was stuttering. He couldn't believe what he was saying. He said, I swear to God, on H&E, &E, it was completely normal. But on 117, it's so obvious that so many of the cells I had thought were lymphocytes actually are mast cells. So I call her in. And I said, I think you have a rare form of a rare disease. And how do we treat it? Because there's nothing in the books about this. Well, we were just beginning to learn at that time that there's this magic drug, uh, imatinib, uh, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that had been uh, released in 2001 as a miracle drug for treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. And we had learned a couple of years after that that although imatinib fails to work in almost every case of mastocytosis because there's one particular mutation that is almost always found in mastocytosis that actually makes those malignant mast cells resistant to imatinib, but there are a few mastocytosis patients, the weird ones, who don't have that particular mutation. And in those mast cell patients, imatinib works wonderfully. 
Right? So I decided we would try our onimatinib, and we started at the lowest available dose. I said after a week, if you're tolerating it okay, but you haven't, uh, haven't uh, yet gotten any better, then double it and come back in a month and we'll see where you go. Now you have to understand, she was coming in my clinic week after, uh, not, uh, month after month after month. We were about a year into this evaluation at this point. Uh, always just dragging her bone weary, utterly exhausted butt into my exam room. Uh, visit after visit after visit. So she came back a month later. I walk in the exam room and my head spun free. So it was a literal double take. I did her. Right. She was sitting there beaming. She was radiating energy. I asked her, I asked her what did you do? And she said, I did what you told me to do. Uh, she didn't get anything out of the initial dose, but she doubled it. And You'll learn, if you haven't already in your medical training, uh, your pharmacology class, that you get to steady state of any given drug, given it a, a specific dose after four uh, dosings, after four half-lives of the drug. Well, she woke up on the morning of the fifth day, so she had taken four doses of the, the double dose, and she woke on the morning of the fifth day. Now, she had been waking every morning for years, and it took two hours for her to drag her exhausted butt out of bed. She woke that morning and she was instantly aware. She hadn't moved yet. She just woke lying in bed and she was instantly cognizant that all of her symptoms were gone. And she leaped out of bed. And short story, I saw her in follow up a couple months ago. I think this is 11 years in now and she has just been running like a rabbit. Uh, ever since. She had lost her business previously because she was so ill. She put it all back together and she's just been running like a rabbit ever since. Literally the day after I saw that response, I saw this lady as a new patient. I was her sixth hematologist that she was seeing as a consultant for her uh, pure red cell aplasia where the bone marrow just gives up making red blood cells. And although we know certain causes for PRCA, for example, a parvovirus B19 infection, for her, no identifiable cause. Total mystery. She was heavily transfusion dependent. Two to three units of blood every two to three weeks for the last few years to maintain a hemoglobin of about five to six, which is uh, about half of what it should be. Um, she was refractory to all standard treatments for PRCA. And I looked at her at that initial visit, and in 60 seconds, I said, you can't possibly have PRCA. I mean, I understand your bone marrow is giving up making red blood cells. But when you have PRCA, the only problem you have is you're not making red blood cells. And you have the consequences of that. You have anemia, you have fatigue, you may have shortness of breath. That's it. She had 600 different symptoms in every system in the body. And there's no way that PRCA works like that. So the question that came, what is inhibiting red blood cell production in you that's also causing all these other problems? So based on what I learned from the first patient, I did some testing for mast cells. I, I, I had suspicion that she just had, I mean, she had had every other test imaginable, every other disease had been ruled out, and there were enough things going on with her that were consistent with inappropriately activated mast cells that I thought it was worth testing. So I learned how to do the testing by that point. Indeed, she had a markedly elevated prostaglandin D2, and I didn't call her atypical mastocytosis because there was a new term coming into the literature at that point, mast cell activation syndrome, and that's what she really fit. Like my first patient. So that's what I diagnosed her. And with antihistamines alone, hemoglobin came up to eight. She no longer needed any transfusions. And that happened in just a few weeks. I tried a few other drugs, uh, targeted the mast cell, nothing much happened. I then wound up trying what cost $150,000 a year in the US, uh, imatinib, and in a month, boom. Hemoglobin normalized. 
Ironically, a year later, she lost that response to a bad head. And then I was able to try a drug that cost only $20,000 a year in the U.S. that I had not been allowed to try initially because her insurer at the time would not allow me to prescribe chromalin, chromoglycate here, I think. Uh, but they would allow me to prescribe a mat. I mean, nobody's ever said an insurance company has ever thought sanely. Uh, but a year later when she relapsed, she had changed insurance companies. And the new insurance company allowed me to try Promolin. And in just a month, we regained the full remission in her. Uh, which is kind of interesting when you think about it, because Promolin is a very unusual drug. Uh, it does not get absorbed. So all the Promolin she was drinking, it was settling down the GI tract mast cells, but it wasn't getting absorbed, wasn't circulating wasn't settling down mast cells anywhere else. So somehow the GI tract, the, the dysfunctional GI tract mast cells were releasing mediators which were coming to either directly or indirectly intensively suppress red blood cell production in the bone marrow. So it was a good lesson on how mast cell mediators can have not only local effects, but also very remote effects. I had already been working by that point for four years on this strange woman who in her mid-50s had developed burning mass just one night. Overnight, she woke up the next morning. She had been fine, and she woke up, and 11 out of 10 burning pain in her mouth and also pain throughout the rest of the GI tract from stem to stern, but it was worse than the mouth by far. She underwent every conceivable evaluation over the next nine months or so. Nobody could find anything until a very enterprising endocrinologist wondered if she might have a weird form of a neuroendocrine cancer. And so he checked a chromogram A level, which can be a marker of neuroendocrine tumors, and it was a hundredfold elevated. So he said, aha, you must have a neuroendocrine cancer. That's the only thing we know that can produce a chromogranate A level that high. So off to hematology, oncology, you go to get your cancer uh, formally diagnosed and treated. And being the dumping ground for the mystery cases, she wound up in my clinic. And I walk in the exam room for the first visit and right away, no, no way can this be and listen, everybody in this room, if you're going to have a hundredfold <coughs> elevated chromogranate A level from a neuroendocrine cancer, you're going to have an advanced neuroendocrine cancer. And everybody in this room knows what an advanced cancer patient looks like. She didn't look anything like that. Yes, she was in pain. There was no question about that. But she didn't look anything like an advanced cancer patient. So then the question became, what do you have that can cause this elevated chromogranin A in the burning mouth? And it turned out she actually did have a lot of other symptoms that all of her evaluating physicians had long been ignoring because the burning mouth pain was such an overwhelming symptom. Everybody was focusing on that and ignoring all the other problems. <coughs> but remember, I started evaluating her a few years earlier and those other two patients. So I didn't even know about mast cell disease yet. So the only thing I knew that could cause an elevated chromogranin A was neuroendocrine cancer. And even though she didn't look like she had that, I didn't know what else to do. So I did what I was trained to do. I evaluated for neuroendocrine cancer, and you don't want to know how much money I spent doing the fancy test to evaluate her for that. And everything was negative. <clears throat> and I called the top five neuroendocrine cancer experts in the US and said, and I reviewed my workup with them. I said, what am I missing? And they all congratulated me on how thorough the work that I had done. And they said they didn't know either why I was uh, missing it. But it has to be there. There is no other explanation for this. So they recommended, uh, unanimously, they recommended I should just repeat this $50,000 set of, of tests about every six months. Because cancers grow and eventually it will be found. And that 
didn't make a whole lot of sense to me uh, and actually did not follow that advice. And you don't want to know about the other crazy diagnoses I considered in the next few years. But as I was starting to learn about mast cell disease, I also learned that guess what type of cell in the human body can also produce chrome gram A? The mast cell. And so with all of her GI issues, she of course had undergone endoscopy with biopsies. So I had the old, you know, listen, we throw out blood and urine specimens almost immediately, but the biopsies are retained by the pathologist for years. Thank God they're so anal retentive. Actually, <laughs> that's not fair. It's usually a state or federal law that mandates retention of biopsies. But anyway, we were able to go back to our old biopsies. We did this spec, and they had been read out as normal, but we did this special staining, and boom, there were the increased mast cells. And with some very simple, very cheap therapy, we almost completely obliterated the pain virtually overnight. It was like 48 hours to get a response. So I called up our chief oral surgeon. And I said, do you have any of these, uh, any other of these uh, Bernie Mouse syndrome patients? And he said, oh, God. Because <laughs> that's what happens. Regular doctors have never heard of this before because no explanation can be found for this. So these patients rapidly get diverted to the oral surgeons and the dentists who hate seeing them because they can never find anything wrong with them. They think they're all crazy. And so I called up the chief oral surgeon. I said, do you have any of these other uh, of these cases? He said, oh, God, I hate seeing these people. And I said, well, I've got an idea. Why don't you send me a few? He said, great. <laughs> and I saw a series of them, and every single one turned out to have MCAS. Now, it took different treatments, different mast cell targeted treatments in different patients to get them better, but they all got better. And I published a paper about that some time ago. So, here's the central issue. Clearly, a highly uh, diverse, uh, heterogeneously presenting disease, but it's the same root issue. So, could other uh, presentations be possible, and how can one disease do this? So to get to an answer to that question, you gotta understand a few other basics about mast cell disease first. First of all, for, for centuries, uh, the, the only disease of the mast cell we've known have been the allergic disease. We've known about allergic type issues for millennia, okay, for, for all of human history. Uh, it is a prevalent <laughs> disorder in its various forms. There appears to be increasing incidence and prevalence in the modern era, and there are various uh, hypotheses as to why that is. You heard one earlier today from Mr. Tobin. Um, we still have a lot of research to do in this area to understand why the incidence uh, and the prevalence are increasing. It is uh, the allergic diseases clearly are driven by both genetic and environmental factors. And fortunately, um, it, it, it's mostly a quality of life issue. There are relatively few patients who die from the allergic disorders. Um, and then there is the mast cell disease we learned about about a century ago. Um, 1869 is when uh, we had the first description of the cutaneous form of mastocytosis called urticaria pigmentosa. Uh, a decade later, the first description of the mast cell, a decade after that, the two uh, 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 urticaria pigmentosa was linked with mast cells. It took a half century more to understand there were internal diseases of the mast cell, it wasn't just cutaneous. Around that time, we began identifying the mast cell mediators, starting with heparin, and later histamine, tryptase, and then many, many others later. Um, in the mid-90s, we found the one mutation, the KIT D816B mutation, which is present in almost every patient with mastocytosis. Um, and in 2001, the WHO uh, classification system for the different forms of mastocytosis came along, 
That's when the wonder drug imatinib came out for CML, and as I said a few years later, we began to understand this worked terrifically for the rare patients, the rare, rare, rare patients who did uh, who had massive psychosis but did not have this mutation. And in the first 20 years of uh, this century, we have come to understand that even in the patients who had this cancerous form of mast cell disease that we call mastocytosis, the symptoms that they have really are not consequential to the number of mast cells they have. It's not like other cancers where the symptoms they have are from the expanding bulk of the tumor. Now, the symptoms that a mastocytosis patient has comes from the inappropriate activation of these dysfunctional, these cancerous mast cells, the inappropriate production and release of the mast cell mediators. So this was the spectrum of mast cell disease that we used to know about. Think of it as a mountain where the bulk of the mountain are the allergic type disorders, allergies, anaphylaxis, urticaries, angioedema, and the tip of the mountain was mastocytosis in its various forms, cutaneous mastocytosis in tenfold more common than uh, the various forms of systemic mastocytosis. The whole mountain features inappropriate activation of the mast cells, but only the tip of the mountain features inappropriate proliferation of the mast cells. Now, mast cell activation disease. This doesn't go back to 1869. This only goes back to the mid-1980s when it was first hypothesized that there ought to be diseases in which we have inappropriate activation of the mast cell with little to no proliferation of the mast cell. And then you had to go another 20 years before we first got the first case reports of what's now called mast cell activation syndrome. And in the same year, very importantly, the first study out of the University of Bonn showing that almost every patient with mast cell activation syndrome has mutations in various key mast cell regulatory genes. The dominant mast cell regulatory gene called KIT is almost always mutated in MCAS, and there are many, many other mast cell regulatory genes that may be mutated as well. A confirmatory study was done in 2010. Uh, this uh, looked at another cohort of MCAS patients and healthy control patients, because you'd like to know that you're not finding these mutations in the healthy controls, and indeed, they did not. Okay. We had the first proposal that year of diagnostic criteria for mast cell activation syndrome. But there were a lot of problems with that proposal. Uh, my uh, collaborators in Bonn and myself as senior author at NUSC, we uh, published an alternative proposal for diagnostic criteria the following year. The original group uh, revised their criteria in 2012, but it's still exceedingly problematic, in my opinion. Um, and in 2016, the WHO revised uh, their diagnostic criteria for systemic mastocytosis and pretty wisely, I think, did not say one thing about mast cell activation syndrome, still recognizing that there's a lot of controversy in what the proper <laughs> diagnostic criteria for this newly recognized entity ought to be. So this is the new model <coughs> of the land of the mass cell disease. You have the same mountain that you had before. I mean, when allergic diseases are affecting 10 to 20% of the global population, that's a mountain. But now you need to think of it as an iceberg. Because the mountain is what's easily visible above a, a water line easy clinical recognizability. Submerged below this waterline is this humongous collection of different variants of what we presently only know to very generically call mast cell activation syndrome. 
I don't doubt that as time goes on, we'll learn very well how to distinguish the different variants. And we will get to the point where we are subsetting MCAS the way we are subsetting all the different forms of massocytosis. But that's going to come over ensuing decades. Just a reminder that the mast cell does descend from the hematopoietic stem cell. And a key point here is that the paleogeneticists, and who knew there were such people, uh, but there are, uh, they have long ago figured out that the mast cell, or its ancestor, was the original host defense cell as eukaryotic or multicellular organisms were just beginning to evolve. So all of these other host defense cells, which all do their much more limited uh, defense jobs much more effectively than the mast cell does, but they all came along in the evolutionary tree hundreds of millions of years later. The mast cell was the only defense cell that multicellular organisms had more than 500 million years ago. So those cells, the mast cells, had to pick up an awful lot of tricks to keep the multicellular organism alive to reproduce to the next generation. And here we are 500 million years later, and these cells still remember all their old tricks. Not a problem as long as they are behaving normally in a controlled fashion. But when they start misbehaving, <clears throat> the weapons at their disposal, it's an armamentarium of unimaginable breadth. These cells were born in the bone marrow, a uh, very tiny proportion of all the nucleated cells in the marrow. They leave the marrow soon after being born, so to speak. They circulate only briefly. They come to, uh, they, they, they uh, uh, go off into the peripheral tissues very quickly, and that's where they complete maturation. Uh, limited mobility beyond that point. Um, Again, <coughs> they're especially abundant at the environmental interfaces and in the walls of all vessels. And this is exactly where you'd expect them to be to best serve their principal role in post-defense. That's where you want cells to be positioned if they are going to be detecting assaults upon the body. Okay. The mast cell actually responds faster to assaults than any other cell in the immune system. Lymphocytes take hours to activate. Neutrophils take minutes to activate. The mast cell activates in sub-second time. The mast cells, their principal role is to synthesize uh, a wide variety of very potent mediators, again, variably released upon various triggerings. You also need to understand that the tyrosine kinase kit um, is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase expressed at very high levels on the surface of the mast cell, tenfold more brightly than on any other human cell. And normal numbers, normal copy numbers of normally functioning kit are critical for normal mast cell survival, activation, and a lot of other behaviors. A little cartoon illustrating the, the cell surface up there. You have a homodimer of kit. This is the normal configuration. A homodimer of kit. The natural ligand for that homodimer is stem cell factor. And when a molecule of stem cell factor engages that receptor, then you have immediate activation of a myriad of downstream pathways that ultimately lead to mediator production and release. Mast cells are triggered in a huge variety of fashions. The medical students in their traditional training will only learn about one. You'll learn about the classic IgE mediated pathway, classic allergen mediated pathway for activating the mast cells. But in truth, they also can be activated by a very wide variety of physical forces, 
and they also have receptors for a humongous array of other factors, uh, histamine, stem cell factor, immunoglobulin, complement, CRF is interesting, corticotropin releasing factor. This is one of the principal hormones that it instantly comes flooding out of a number of organs, particularly the brain, anytime we have suffered stress. And if you talk to a mast cell patient, not all of them, but many of them will tell you that stress of any sort is an acute trigger for an escalation in their symptoms, flaring of their symptoms. Mast cells have receptors for opioids, for benzodiazepines, for cannabinoids. Anybody who thinks that cannabis is operating just on the neurons, <laughs> also hitting the mast cells. And of course, because the mast cells are there to detect infection, uh, there are uh, many of the toll-like receptors and TLRs on the mast cells. All right, 3D microscopic uh, video, 3D video microscopy from uh, Dr. Theo, Theo Harrity's at Tufts University, internationally recognized mast cell researcher. Watch what happens when one molecule of substance P comes to dock with the substance P receptor on the surface of the mast cell. You see the outpocketings? This is the explosive degranulation of the mast cell. The mast cell is acutely releasing all of its mediator stops when it gets triggered. <coughs> so the mast cell is now recognized to produce and release more than a thousand different mediators. This is a small sample of all those mediators. I realize you, that's too small for you to read. That's kind of the point, because the real list, <laughs> with, if I were to put that up here, would make this utterly microscopic, okay? These are the current diagnostic criteria for systemic <coughs> mastocytosis. There's no need to go into the details here. The point I want to make from this is that these criteria do a pretty good job of very specifically identifying the patients, the, the rare patients who have mastocytosis. But these criteria also create a problem. Because it turns out there are an awful lot of patients, not, not, not a rare phenomenon, an awful lot of patients who have the symptoms that are suggestive of mastocytosis. Remember, the symptoms in mastocytosis are coming from an activation, not from the cancerous proliferation. Method. All these patients are the symptoms of mastocytosis, and yet you cannot find the mastocytosis in them. And so they wind up getting all these other diagnoses, and this is a trivially small sample of all the diagnoses they get to explain all their many, many, many other problems. So this is the problem. What do you do when it looks like a duck? It looks like mastocytosis, it acts like a duck, it quacks like a duck, but it's not a duck. This is where the new concept of mast cell activation syndrome comes in. And we all have to now start becoming aware of this. This is one of the proposals for diagnostic criteria for this disease. I'm not going to go through the details. Suffice to say, you can probably tell the theme here. There are a lot of problems with this particular proposal. Happy to discuss more in Q&A if you want. This is the alternative proposal. I know it looks complicated, but uh, what it boils down to for most patients who get diagnosed with MCAS by these criteria is that you combine the major criterion in which you have symptoms that are consistent with chronic, uh, abnormal mast cell mediator release, and you combine that with laboratory evidence of mast cell activation. And that's 
how we get to the diagnosis in most patients who have this disease. There are increasing estimates of prevalence of MCAS, as estimates as high as 17% from some preliminary data sets that have been collected. And there is increasing evidence of critical mast cell involvement in a humongous variety of chronic inflammatory diseases. And so the question starts to arise, what proportion of the population of patients with IBS or CFS or fibromyalgia or so on, what proportion of the population of each of uh, the patients with each of these diseases actually has some particular variant of MCAS at the root of it? Because the sine qua non of MCAS is, and this is a consequence of the mediators, is chronic multi-system inflammation. Well, that's what these diseases are. So perhaps some proportion of the patients with fibromyalgia might actually have some particular variant of MCAS at the root of it. God knows nobody else has ever been able to figure out any other cause of fibromyalgia. So I'm not saying that MCAS is a known cause of fibromyalgia, but there sure are a lot of MCAS patients who have acquired over time a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or IBS, and so on and so forth. All right, so we think this is clonal in most cases. The good folks at the University of Bonn have identified a wide variety of mutations in the mass. Well, these are somatic <coughs> mutations, not congenital, not inborn mutations not inherited mutations, these are somatic mutations, just like in cancer. It's just that these somatic mutations are not driving, you know, cancerous proliferation of the mutated cell, and instead they're just driving inappropriate activation of the mutated cell. These findings in Bond, to be clear, have not yet been independently confirmed, is the hallmark of good science, but it's not because other institutions have tried and failed to find these mutations. It's just that so far, again, keep in mind, we've only known about this for a decade so far, but so far, nobody else has even tried to find these mutations. But the folks in Bonn have run multiple experiments, multiple projects. They keep coming up with the same results over and over. So, to go answer the original question, how could it be that one disease presents in so many different ways? Well, mast cells produce and release scores of mediators and one mutation that leads to inappropriate activation of the mast cell is going to lead to inappropriate release of some number of the more than 1,000 mediators the mast cell produces. And that inappropriate release is going to create some potential for multi-system illness and clinical variability. But it's worse than that because these patients don't have just one mutation in their mast cell regulatory genes. The folks in Bonn have shown these patients almost always have multiple mutations and that's just in kit. And then there are other genes as well that are usually mutated. And it's even worse than that because each mediator has not just one effect, but has its own unique, huge array of effects. Direct effects, indirect effects, local effects, remote effects, acute effects, delayed effects, chronic effects. This is how one disease causes so many different problems. So what does it look like clinically? Inflammation is the universal constant because many of the mast cell mediators create inflammatory effects. There may or may not be allergic type phenomena. And the hardest features of all to recognize are the abnormalities in growth and development in the tissues. Turns out that a number of the mast cell mediators are critically involved in guiding growth and development in all tissues in the body. Now, our mammalian brains are wired to be really good at recognizing the acute changes that we see in our environment so we can recognize our patients' inflammatory and allergic problems just like that. 
but recognizing the slowly emerging growth and development problems can sometimes be quite challenging to the diagnostician. These patients typically have onset of symptoms in adolescence, sometimes childhood, occasionally even uh, right from the womb. Uh, but their symptoms go on for decades because the disease just doesn't get recognized. This is an educational issue. Come back in 50 years, and every medical trainee will come out of training knowing about this disease, just like today they come out of training knowing about diabetes and hypertension. Mm -hmm. But for now, these patients go for decades without being recognized. It's usually multi-system. The symptoms are often inflammatory. It is a perplexingly inconstant course as the mast cells are releasing the mediators uh, in, in, in different patterns at different times in response to different triggers. Understand there is both constitutive mediator release being driven by these mutations, so baseline inappropriate mediator release and inappropriate reactive mediator release. So reactions to the things, some of the things like uh, Mr. Tobin was uh, explaining earlier. <clears throat> Triptase is a great marker for the rare mast cell disease of mastocytosis. It's almost always hugely elevated in mastocytosis, but it turns out that tryptase is normal and persistently so in about 85% of MCAS patients. And if you want to go through the biology of why that is, we can do that later in Q&A. But generations of doctors have now been taught that if you don't have an elevated tryptase level, you cannot have a mast cell disorder. We now know that's wrong. A normal tryptase level may go a long way toward ruling out mastocytosis but it doesn't even begin to rule out MCAS. And instead, we have to look at these other mediators, but I'll be the first to acknowledge it is technically challenging, technically and logistically challenging doing this. Some of these mediators have half-lives on the order of 30 to 60 seconds. I mean, think about it. If you have mediators that are as potent as these mediators are in their effects, wouldn't you want them to have pretty short half-lives? These patients see boatloads of doctors, acquire truckloads of diagnoses, and are often consigned to the purgatory of psychosomatism. The doctor doesn't know any disease. That can explain all the symptoms these patients have. So they say, you're dreaming them up. Think of what that does to the patient's psyche. And put yourself in these patients' shoes. You have some particular symptom. You've been to 23 different doctors. You've spent thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars investigating. And every doctor keeps telling you, there's nothing wrong with you. We can't find anything. You're crazy. What would you do? You'd stop telling your doctor about the problem. You would find <coughs> some way to just suck it up and live with it. And that's what these patients do. And so it's critical for the doctor who's beginning to sniff a mast cell activation problem in the patient to be very diligent in taking the review of systems. This is the one part of the history that most doctors hate going through because it can be exhausting. It's usually very unproductive going through the review of systems with most patients. But in a mass <coughs> patient, you have got to pull these symptoms, these complaints out of the patients. This is the natural lifetime course of the disease. So always waxing and waning, always active to some degree. But from time to time, it substantially escalates its baseline level of misbehavior. And these escalations tend to emerge shortly following major stressors. What we think is going on is the stressors are actually inducing additional somatic mutation. The constitutional issues are all over that. And look at the, the theme here. System after system after system after system. Inflammation, 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 inflammation. System after system, it's inflammation, inflammation in just different 
forms and fashions over and over and over again. The GI issues, boy, do these patients drive their gastroenterologist crazy with the alternating diarrhea and constipation that most of them have. These the women with this disease quite often have urinary tract infection, UTI after UTI after UTI after UTI, and yet when you do the urine testing on these patients, many of the urine tests don't show any infection. <coughs> That's because they don't have infection. It hurts, but inflammation hurts, regardless of whether it's driven by an actual infection or it is sterile, non-infectious inflammation being induced by release of the inflammatory mediators from the dysfunctional mast cells in the urinary tract. <coughs> the muscles, the bones, the joints are all affected. Remember, remember I said the environmental interfaces where you tend to find these cells, so no surprise that the integument has an awful lot of issues in this disease, not just the skin, but uh, hair loss, uh, changes in the nails, their teeth often just are crumbling and decaying despite the best of dental care, drives their dentists batty. Until you make the right diagnosis and apply the right treatment. The neurologic issues, not only central, but also peripheral nerves, uh, neurologic issues are all over the map. Um, and therefore you get not only a lot of neurologic uh, presentations, but also a lot of psychiatric presentations. Hematologic issues are all over the map. You already saw at the beginning how the blood counts can be high or low. Same thing with the white blood cell counts, the platelet counts. You can have too much clotting. You can have too little clotting. Remember what the first mast cell mediator ever discovered was? Heparin. Which is an anti, a very potent anticoagulant. There's only one cell in the human body that makes heparin, and that's the mast cell. The mast cells are warehouses of heparin. Not a problem as long as they're normal mast cells, which are very carefully dribbling out very tiny bits of heparin under carefully controlled circumstances. But when you have abnormal mast cells, that periodically you're just dumping their loads of heparin into the tissues, you're going to bleed, you're going to bruise. Okay. The immune issues are all over the map. The endocrinologic and metabolic issues are all over the map. The growth and development issues are all over the map. And I know I'm going uh, too quickly through many of these slides for you to get all the details. I'm happy to provide a copy uh, later for anybody who wants. So, in the end, how do we diagnose such a complex and variable disease? Well, first of all, you gotta to resort to the physician's best friend. Yeah, I know we got lots of fancy and expensive uh, <coughs> testing machines these days, but honest to God, for diagnosing this disease, it comes back to a complete history and physical. And you have to restore your faith in Occam's razor. Honestly, what's more likely? Is this patient who has 57 problems on the problem list, is this patient uh, more just so uniquely unlucky as to have coincidentally acquired so many different problems, all of them developing independently of one another? Or is it more likely they got one thing going on? that is biologically capable of causing, directly or indirectly, most or all, probably all, of the patient's problems. This is the diagnostic workup in 2019. I know it's too small to, to read the details, but the bottom line up at the top, the, the top thing here is the most important thing. Suspect it. I mean, how can you diagnose anything if you're not even considering it in the first place? So you have to learn how, you know, which patients you should be suspecting it in. Then there's initial testing, which can be as simple as checking a tryptase level to uh, be pretty confident you're not dealing with that rare case of mastocytosis. And beyond that, it's the other testing, which yep, at present it's challenging. But if you don't pursue this, 
the patient's not going to get diagnosed and they are going to continue languishing for decades longer without the proper diagnosis, without the proper treatment. That's no way to treat a person. I don't have time to go into the technicalities of the lab issues. Prognosis, most of these patients live a normal lifespan. It's a chronically miserable life until it gets accurately diagnosed and effectively controlled. But even if it takes a few years to find the particular drugs which are going to best help control the disease in the individual patient, that's okay. They've already proven for 20, 40, 60 years they can survive this. And the available statistics say they are highly likely to continue surviving it to a normal lifespan. And so they're going to have the time to find effective treatment. The treatment, very briefly, I don't have time to go into the details, but these are the broad categories of treatment. First, as you heard Mr. Tobin say, identify and avoid the triggers, because frankly, it's kind of hard for any drug to gain good, sustained control over dysfunctional mast cells when the patient is simultaneously, persistently ingesting or otherwise exposing himself to a trigger. Over time, as they come to gain better control over the disease, they may well regain some measure of tolerance to things which previously had become intolerable. But that's over time. To begin with, identify and avoid the triggers. Pharmacologic routes to dealing with this, we can inhibit mediator production. We can inhibit mediator release. Lots of drugs for that. If the mediators get released anyway, we have a whole cavalcade of drugs that can block the actions of those mediators. This is not a cancer. Chemotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy has no role in this disease. In theory, an allogeneic stem cell transplant ought to be able to cure this, but there are is just a host of issues in doing this sort of toxic, expensive treatment, doing it safely in the tiny population of MCAS patients in whom it would make sense. It's only the worst of the worst of MCAS patients in whom you want to try this, and those are the patients in whom it probably would be hardest to do that treatment safely. I don't know if anybody who has transplanted uh, a case of MCAS yet. Um, and finally, the secondary issues that emerge from the mediators, uh, they of course need to be uh, addressed. Um, enough on that. I don't have time to go into the nursing issues. Uh, this is all from a paper I published a couple of years ago providing a detailed characterization of MCAS. Uh, just more thoughts that we need to investigate what proportion of the patients with all of these various diseases might have a sort of variance of MCAS at the root of eye. And what if you could find that, say, I don't know, 20%, 80% of chronic fatigue syndrome actually is mast cell activation syndrome of a particular type with certain somatic mutations in the mast cells at the root of it. You've now changed the paradigm in chronic fatigue syndrome. We've been studying chronic fatigue syndrome for what, 30, 40 years? Can't find any cause. Every infectious organism on the planet has been ruled out. All other causes have been ruled out. What if we can define it as a clonal disease? Aha, at that point, we can figure out which mediators are driving it, and we can figure out how these mutations and how these mediators are causing it, and then we can actually intelligently design treatments. So we need to improve our diagnostic techniques for this. We need to better understand the etiology of it. Uh, some very interesting ideas emerging in this realm here, the epigenetic realm. 
Uh, we need to get much better at uh, predicting which. We have a boatload of treatments, as I flew through those slides a minute ago, a boatload of drugs, which have been found helpful in various mass cell patients. It's just very frustrating that at this early point in our understanding of this disease, we don't have even a single method yet for scientifically reliably predicting which of these many, many, many treatments is best going to help the individual patient. So there's no question about it. It takes a lot of patience and persistence and a methodical approach on the parts of both the patient and the treating physician to figure out the optimal treatment for the individual patient. But most patients do get to the goal of feeling significantly better than the pre-treatment baseline the majority of the time. And of course, we need to improve education. So that's it. I appreciate your time and uh, happy to take questions. That's exactly the question I've been asking pathologists for a decade now. Should you be doing CD117 staining standard on every set of, maybe, maybe not maybe not every biopsy they get, but certainly in the areas where you expect the mast cells to dominantly show up, so GI tract biopsies, genitourinary tract biopsies, and I think it will come to that, but right now the pathologists have no more awareness of this disease than any other type of doctor. So they're just not anywhere close yet to the point of saying, uh, of coming to accept that this is so prevalent a problem that, yeah, this needs to be standard. But you're right, that's good insight. It does need to become standard. Excellent question. You know, I can show you, um, I can show you right now that it'll hook up to Wi-Fi, the uh, seminal paper from the New England Journal of Medicine in 1987 uh, from the guy who discovered tryptase. And the paper, the title of the paper says, Tryptase as a marker of mast cell activation in systemic mastocytosis. And so for, <coughs> for the next quarter century, we thought that tryptase was an excellent marker of mast cell activation. But there's a joke, the medical students probably know this old joke, that the medical school dean greets the incoming class of freshmen and tells them half of everything we're going to teach in the next four years is wrong. We just don't know which half. And it's funny because it's true. And this is a perfect example of it because the guy who first discovered tryptase has now been publishing and presenting for the last 15 years. Oops. As it turns out, the tryptase is a miserable marker of mast cell activation. Tryptase is constitutively expressed by all mast cells. Therefore, the more mast cells you have, the higher your tryptase level is going to be. So if you have a disease of the mast cell that features both inappropriate activation and inappropriate proliferation to a cancerous degree, you're going to have a very high tryptase level. But if you have a disease of the mast cell where you have inappropriate activation, but little to no excessive proliferation of the mast cell, then you should expect the tryptase level to be elevated little to none, usually none. And that's exactly what we see. I think we will. Um, but I'll tell you where I, I, I think that diagnostic, diagnostic testing really needs to head, where I think it will head, but it's just going to take time to, to get there. Measuring these mediators is so, measuring them accurately 
is so difficult that it's easy. Uh, you know the old saying about a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So when there's like one laboratory in the country that can run a particular test and that laboratory is thousands of miles away and you have to keep that specimen chill the entire trip, if only one person in the chain of handling mishandles the specimen, then in just a few minutes, you've lost what you're looking for. So, and furthermore, work. The mass cell produces more than a thousand mediators, but most of those we can't even measure yet in the clinical laboratory. We can measure them in the research laboratory, that's how we know they exist, but we can't measure them in a clinical laboratory. And of the minority that we can measure in the clinical laboratory, the majority of those are not particularly specific to the mast cell. So in the end, we're left with only about 10 mast cell mediators that we can measure in the clinical lab and which are relatively specific to the mast cell. But if you think about it, if you're only measuring 10 out of more than 1,000 mediators the cell produces, why on earth would any rational person think that the symptoms a given mast cell patient is having are necessarily coming from the few mediators you're measuring. I mean, when you think about it, what you're measuring is a terribly poor surrogate for the totality of the signaling chaos going on in this disease. And yet at present, this is the best we can measure, so it's what we do. Where I think we're headed is genetics, okay? We already have very good sequencing tools, you know, mutation and uh, detection and analysis tools. The problem is that they're all, all those tools are geared to detecting um, uh, uh, inborn mutations, you know, germline mutations that are present in every cell in the body. So you can take a blood sample and take the white blood cell, the general nucleated cell population. And if there's a mutation that's present in every cell in the body, then it's gonna be present in virtually every white blood cell. And you can run that sample through a sequencer and very quickly identify those mutations. The mast cells comprise at best 0.02% of the total leukocyte population. And we're not even talking about all the mast cells being mutated in an MCAS patient, it's just the mast cell progeny of the mutated, the somatically mutated stem cell. So it's just a fraction of that 0.02% that is mutated. And therefore, if you use your standard uh, techniques for sequencing, you cannot pick up that mutational signal, that tiny, tiny, tiny mutational signal out of the background noise of all of the other wild type, you know, unmutated cells. So what you need uh, to, to operationalize on a routine clinical basis is exactly what the folks, the very clever folks at the University of Bonn did, is they took a, a blood sample to start with, and then they extracted the mast cells. And because there are so few mast cells in the blood, they wound up having to taking a fairly large blood sample. So they could get enough mast cells to, to sequence. And once they had that purified population and put that sample into the sequencer, boom, you find the mutations. So we have to get to the point where we can routinely extract the mast cells out of the blood sample in the clinical lab, not just the research laboratory, do it in the clinical laboratory, then do the sequencing, and we will begin to learn, oh, you don't, it's not, that, it's not just that you have MCAS and you have MCAS and you have MCAS, it's that you have MCAS with this particular mutational profile, and you have MCAS with this other mu mutational profile, and so on and so forth, and in that fashion, we will begin understanding why these patients present so differently from one another, and even better, we'll be able to figure out which treatments are <coughs> to help. I mean, it's the ultimate in personalized medicine. Uh, sorry, one more thing. No, no, sorry, oh, sorry, no. Okay, yeah, should we move on to some of the questions? Just to make a point for the test, for the 10 tests they can do in the States and Ireland, we can do one, which is triptase. 
We can also measure heart rate, but only therapeutic levels of heart rate. So essentially, in Ireland at the moment, we have nothing in our arsenal mm -hmm. for uh, testing for yeah. Yes, sir. So microRNAs are really important in new regulators. That's why I have a little trouble here. MicroRNAs. MicroRNAs. Uh, we do. Uh, we're beginning to learn. This is in just the last <laughs> four or five years. Beginning to learn that there are microRNA. It's not just the genes, the regulatory genes in the mast cells that are mutated, but it's other regulatory elements too, including uh, microRNAs. Well, I mean, I can guesstimate on that. I mean, I, you saw that I put up there that current published estimates on the prevalence of the disease range from rare to as much as 17%. I can tell you from my clinical experience, I think the truth of the matter is going to turn out to be a lot closer to that 17% figure. We're talking a sixth of the population. And yes, that immediately brings up questions as to why this disease is so prevalent, and that's a whole other discussion. But to answer your point, if you've got a sixth of the population that is going decades undiagnosed, they're seeing countless physicians undergoing immense amounts of testing, um, uh, clinic visits, emergency visits, hospitalizations, and then there is, so there's the cost of the evaluations, all the treatments that they are empirically prescribed. The doctor doesn't quite know what's going on, but uh, let me just prescribe you this to get you out of the office. Um, and so there's the cost of the treatments that don't help. And then even beyond the cost of the healthcare itself, there's the cost of the lost productivity. These patients often are fatigued, they're achy, they can't work. Uh, sometimes they have no choice. They have to work to make a living, but they, they're hurting. They, and, and the cognitive issues, the cognitive issues, they can't think. And so what good does it do an employer to have somebody sitting at a desk when they can't add two and two? And so you can look at this economic question from a myriad of angles, and what you wind up realizing mm -hmm. is what we are losing from not investing in researching, diagnosing, and treating this disease. Uh, I mean, what we're losing is immensely greater. I mean, this is probably, uh, in the U.S., I'm going to guess that, that this is a problem that is costing society in healthcare and lost productivity has to be costing hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Um, and, and that doesn't even begin to speak to the human cost. I don't know how you yeah. quantify pain and suffering and all that. Economists claim they can do it, but I'm not so sure. Yeah. I think the, the key there is going to be getting the, an accurate diagnostic criteria that's accepted because until you do that, you, you, you're going to have a flexible baseline. You would think that it's the insurers who would be most motivated <laughs> to support research yeah. in this, and yet they don't understand that this thing even exists any more so than doctors or laboratory companies or pharmaceutical companies. It's an educational issue. It'll all come in time, but we just all have to appreciate how early in all this we are. And yet, even though we're very early in this, the fact is we are able to diagnose and treat this today, even in spite of how little we know about it. And so does it take a lot of effort? Yeah, does take a lot of expense at present. Yeah, but how can you not do that and just let the patient continue languishing for decades?
specifically with regard to pain, <coughs> again, pain is one of the symptoms of inflammation. And if you can get at what the root cause of the pain is in a patient, then you can often get better. Um, nobody thinks of antihistamines as analgesic drugs. And yet, in a patient with mast cell disease, antihistamines can have analgesic effects. And there are lots of other drugs, too, that can have analgesic effects uh, in mast cell patients. The other thing about drugs, uh, doctors and patients with this disease really need to be aware of. Yes, there are a few classes of pharmaceuticals that really do have an increased likelihood of triggering activation of mast cells, even normal mast cells in healthy people. But in the vast majority of circumstances where a mast cell patient is having an adverse reaction to a medication product that they're newly trying, and keep it, and you also have to be aware that mast cell patients actually have, that they, they absolutely have an increased likelihood of adversely reacting to medication products compared to people who don't have mast cell disease. But in the vast majority of situations where a mast cell patient is trying a new medication product, and right out of the starting gate, within the first few doses, they start having an adverse reaction, it's almost never the drug in that medication product that is triggering the patient's dysfunctional mast cells to further activate and further spew out all these bead eaters that are causing the symptoms. And instead, it is almost always one or more of what we call the excipients, the fillers, the binders, the dyes, the preservers. It's almost always what they actually trigger the dysfunctional mast cells to further activate. So anytime. A patient comes back to me and says, oh, I tried this drug and oh, I had a horrible experience with it. I can't possibly take that. I say, whoa, wait a second. There's no way that drug can be causing those symptoms you were telling me about. It's probably an excipient. And so you don't give up on the drug just because the patient had an adverse reaction to the first formulation of the drug that the patient or the pharmacist randomly pulled off the shelf for the patient to try? No. You look at the ingredient list, you try to identify, and I'm not saying this is easy, but you try to identify which excipient is likely the trigger, and then you work with the pharmacist, you identify an alternative formulation of the same drug, same dose, that just doesn't have the suspected offending excipient. And you try the patient on that formulation, and when they come back from that, telling you, oh, I'm having a great time on this drug. This is the best drug since sliced bread. So at that point, you know, it's not the drug that was the problem. It was the excipient. At that point, by God, it's the excipient you put on the allergy list, not the drug. And in fact, at that point, the pharmacist has another job to do. He needs to check the full ingredient list of every other drug the patient is on to make sure that they don't contain even trace amounts of that offending excipient. Because let me tell you something, mast cell patients can easily go from looking and feeling the picture of health to looking and feeling like death warmed over within minutes of exposure to even a trace amount of whatever it is that's a trigger for them. So step one, in managing this very complex disease is to identify your triggers as precisely as you can and do your best to avoid them. I've been wondering the same thing for a decade. There are fairly clear biological routes by which inappropriate mast cell mediator production and release could drive hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or any of those other diseases I've listed up there. But let's be clear, 
the hard research needed to prove that it is mast cell inappropriate mast cell activation it is in fact what is driving those diseases it's not been done yet yeah. needs to be done will be done eventually but has not been done yet so for now it's hypothesis uh, but i have, have i treated mcas patients who also have eds or pots and then seen their hypermobile EDS and their pots get better? Yeah. It's not that there are no diagnostic criteria at the moment. There, there are two different proposals for diagnostic criteria out there. One Proposal has a lot of problems and actually is probably going to lead to the diagnosis of only about 1%, a very severely afflicted 1% of all the patients who truly have MCAS in one form or another. And then there's the other proposal I prefer to abide by because I think it captures the larger population that truly has this disease. But your question more is, where do you go to get help for this in a country that doesn't yet have a broad understanding? And let me tell you something, the U.S. doesn't have any broad understanding of this either. Um, but, but I do understand the challenge you're facing. And then let, let's say, as, as Mr. Tobin was saying, you can't even access the, the meat eater testing, the, the blood and the urine testing. That's okay, because at a bare minimum, you could uh, ask a gastroenterologist to do endoscopies, take biopsies, and apply the CD-117 stain. Every pathologist in the world knows how to do CD-117 staining and has that available. They just need to be given a reason to apply that stain to the tissue. So the, ga the gastroenterologist tells the pathologist, hey, I have a clinical <coughs> suspicion of mast cell disease. That ought to be enough to just for the pathologist to justify doing it. So there are pathways to achieving diagnosis. What you really need more than anything else is a relatively local doctor. Not that you're going to find a doctor who already, at this very early point, has a good understanding of this disease. You're looking for a doctor who is willing to learn and willing to at least try to help you with this. All those drugs I listed up there for treating this disease, the fact is the great majority of those drugs are safe drugs. And they're easy for any doctor to prescribe and to make. They're just drugs which for the most part, most doctors have never even heard of because they haven't had to take care of mast cell disease before. But if the doctor is willing to learn and willing to try, and I understand most doctors are not like that, and believe you me, doctors have a lot of legitimate reasons why that is the case. But nevertheless, there are some uh, in virtually every community. If you look hard enough, you can find at least a few doctors who are willing to learn, willing to try. They're usually closely guarded secrets. But if you hunt hard enough, you usually can find them. And then let me just offer this uh, to the patients that if you find a local doctor who's willing to learn about this, to, uh, then and, and they're, they just don't know where to go, how to get started on this, just ask them to contact me. And I have uh, materials uh, that can help bring uh, a healthcare professional up to speed fairly quickly. So I'm happy to share what I've learned about this disease with any healthcare professional. All they need to do is ask. Okay. Question. Okay. Uh, kind of a two-part question. The first one is when the memory is corrupted. So yeah. you kind of have had a video a little bit of it. Are you okay with me sharing that with friends who weren't able to come or groups who weren't able to come tonight with EDS or whatever? In fact, we're actually, we're actually videoing over there, and we're going to share that video. Yeah, this, this is probably going to be a higher quality okay. video, probably, and, and the questioning is going to be edited. I've mentioned the main MCAS.ie, so. Right. Okay. 
Uh, at the moment, I guess that I uh, the first video that I found on Gotham Matter, oh, uh, we put up, which is an older version of this, but we have this one up as well. We do so probably so, more appropriate to use a higher quality. Okay. <laughs> so my actual question was following on from the question on the roads and the impact that it have on bodies. My question was on metabolism and mm -hmm. drugs. Is that directly linked to MCAS? Because I always thought that it was to do with the EDS and the connective tissue, either not holding it properly and letting it reciprocate to, through the body too quick. But on one of your slides, I noticed that it mentioned metabolism. So, Well, mast cell disease absolutely can impact a wide variety of metabolic pathways uh, in the human body. Um, but with specific regard to metabolism of drugs, you know, the, 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 the breakdown of a drug and the elimination of a drug from the human body, there's a certain set of enzymes in the human body that are responsible for metabolizing and breaking down drug products. And there are some people in the world who have abnormalities in those enzymes. And cannot break down drugs at the usual pace. And in those patients, if you give them a normal dose of the drug, it doesn't get broken down at the proper pace and the drug builds up in the body in such a fashion that a normal dose comes to act as if it were an overdose. But those mutational problems actually are inborn mutational problems. They're not coming about from issues in the mast cells uh, themselves. So it, it sometimes gets confusing when you see yeah. a patient who's having an adverse reaction to a medication product. If they're having a, a, an adverse reaction of relatively acute onset within the first few doses uh, of trying a new product, that's more likely to be a mast cell uh, reaction to some incipient. Issue, but when you see an abnormal reaction coming on after the patient has been on the drug for maybe two to four weeks or, or longer at that point, then you probably need to start thinking about the diagnostic possibility of mutations in these various drug processing enzymes. And there are tests available that can detect those mutations. Just say, for instance, in one of the most recent times I was in hospital with Trish. Neuralgia. They had obviously to try, they had to try so many different drugs, and one of them that they tried was the fentanyl patch, which should have lasted three days. Within three hours, it not only had absorbed and gone through the system, but was then gone. So, what do you think that that was due yeah, to something it, else or mast cell? No, that, that, that's not a drug processing uh, problem. That That's uh, more likely to be a mast cell yeah, uh, like problem. But keep in mind too, part of the complexity of all this is that, remember how I said there are a few classes of drugs which just naturally have a tendency to activate mast cells? Actually, the narcotics. All narcotics are activators of mast cells. Some narcotics are more egregious in that respect than others. Fentanyl actually happens to be a less egregious offender, but nevertheless, it still does activate the mast cells. And therefore, if you are giving the patient a drug, which on the one hand is binding with the opioid receptors and diminishing pain, but at the same time is also causing activation of the mast cell that comes in contact with, and that activation is releasing mediators, which are increasing pain. And you can see how the drug's net effect isn't going to be anything close to what you would expect in a normal person.